Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at washingtech.com slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast Policy with Podcast. Joe Miller. The Senate kills the FCC's privacy rules. Trump's son-in-law and special advisor Jared Kushner will now lead a government reform SWAT team. And Fiza Patel is my guest. The U.S. Senate passed a resolution last week by a vote of 50 to 48 to overturn the FCC's ISP privacy rules. The rules were designed to prevent ISPs from using sensitive data about their subscribers for the company's own commercial purposes. Ali Breland and Harper Nydig have the story in The Hill. Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law, who is also a senior advisor to the president, will lead a new White House Office of American Innovation, which the president says is intended as sort of a SWAT team that will seek to apply solutions from the world of business to the world of government. The new office will focus on things like Trump's $1 trillion infrastructure plan, which includes a broadband build-out component, as well as modernizing the federal government's technology and improving government operations. Ashley Parker and Philip Rucker report in the Washington Post. The Trump administration issued a ban of electronic devices on flights coming from eight countries, including Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Qatar, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. The UK followed up with a similar ban. Authorities suspect a plot to bring down a plane with explosives hidden in an iPad, according to sources cited by Ewan McCaskill in The Guardian. Google has been battling over the past week to prevent ads from showing up adjacent to hateful and offensive content. The glitch led major advertisers to withdraw spots from YouTube. AT&T and Verizon were among the companies that pulled their advertising from the platform. Google responded by giving advertisers a greater control over where their ads appear. Google's chief business officer, Philip Schindler, also apologized, but reports of ads placed next to offensive content were still coming Coming in as of Monday, Mark Scott reports in the New York Times. Apple has succeeded in persuading a Chinese court that its iPhone 6 and 6 Plus don't infringe the patents of Shenzhen Baili Marketing Services, a now defunct Chinese smartphone manufacturer. If the patent infringement decision against Apple had been upheld, it was seen as threatening to Apple, which is under intense competition in China. But Baili is expected to appeal. Eva Dow and Yang Jai report in the Wall Street Journal. Mark Bergen and Eric Newcomer reported in Bloomberg that an accident in Tempe, Arizona, has prompted Uber to suspend its autonomous vehicle tests in Arizona. According to police, Uber was not at fault and no injuries resulted from the accident. A New York attorney named David Thompson has discovered via a Freedom of Information Act request that on over 400 occasions between 2011 and 2013, the New York City Police Department deployed officers to videotape or surveil activities of Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter protesters. Importantly, the NYPD was unable to produce documentation showing the surveillance was authorized by a judge or higher ups within the NYPD. George Joseph has the story in The Verge. Ida Chavez of The Hill covered a House oversight hearing last week in which lawmakers grilled witnesses from the FBI on how they use facial recognition technology. Lawmakers were highly concerned about the impact the FBI's facial recognition database would have on communities of color as well as the public in general. Finally, the FCC voted unanimously Thursday to clamp down on robocalls. The national do not call list has failed to prevent robocalls. Phone companies will now themselves be permitted to identify numbers associated with robocalls and block the calls from ever reaching their customers. You can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Stay with us.
My guest today is Faiza Patel. She serves as co-director of the Brennan Center's Liberty and National Security Program. She has testified before Congress opposing the dragnet surveillance of Muslims, organized advocacy efforts against state laws designed to incite fear of Islam, and developed legislation creating an independent inspector general for the NYPD. Before joining the Brennan Center, Ms. Patel worked as a senior policy officer at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague and clerked for Judge Sidwa at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Born and raised in Pakistan, Ms. Patel is a graduate of Harvard College and the NYU School of Law. Please welcome Faiza Patel. Faiza, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Joe. So I wanted to turn our attention this week to the surveillance state and the way it targets Muslims in particular. Donald Trump, the candidate, made some policy proposals when he was on the campaign trail to curtail the civil liberties of Muslims by teeing up the NSEERS program and creating a Muslim registry. Can you describe for us what the NSEERS program is, the nature of the Muslim registry and other surveillance proposals coming out of this administration that threaten Muslims? Sure. Um, so clearly targeting Muslims has been a hallmark of the Trump campaign and seems to be continuing into the Trump presidency. Uh, the proposal that you're talking about is either called Muslim Registry uh, or NCRs, but I think they're two slightly different things, so it's probably worth clarifying that. So NCRs was a program which was put in place um, shortly after the 9-11 attacks, which required visitors from 25 specific countries to register with immigration officials and to submit to fingerprinting, photographs, and sort of invasive questioning about their backgrounds uh, and their families. Now, this applied only to visitors from these 25 countries, all of which were Muslim plus North Korea. Um, you know, the program was thought by most people to be a, a crushing failure. They never came up with you know, a single um, terrorism case out of this program. Um, and over time, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, decided that it was really not a useful program, and they had implemented an entry-exit control system, uh, which allowed them to carefully monitor who was coming in and out of the country, and they didn't need NCRs anymore. Now, that being said, there's definitely been a concern uh, from the time that candidate Trump started talking about a Muslim registry that some form of NCRs uh, would be revived. And one of the things that we saw in early March was a new version of the Muslim ban, which blocks travel from six Muslim-majority countries to the United States, uh, as well as suspending uh, the refugee program. Now, one can imagine that the NCR's registration system could be tacked onto that as part of that program, as part of kind of the efforts to tighten up how we handle people coming to the United States from Muslim countries, or it could morph into something that actually affects American citizens and into a requirement that American citizens who are Muslim actually register with the government. And what are some other surveillance proposals coming out of the administration? Are there, is there anything that we should know about that, that's sort of under the radar that, that you know of that folks should be advocating for? Well, one of the concerning things that's already started happening is this questioning of Muslims coming into the country, whether they're citizens or whether they're visiting, about their religious beliefs. And we've seen an increasing number of these cases over the last couple of months where customs agents will be asking people, you know, where they pray, uh, you know, what do they think of President Trump, all of these kinds of questions. And I think that's definitely a kind of ideological screening that seems to be starting at the border. Uh, we've also heard proposals from the secretary of the DHS suggesting that they're going to start asking travelers for passwords to their social media accounts. So there's definitely a push towards kind of really trying to get at what people's beliefs are, whether they're political or religious. And obviously, they can't do this for everybody, right? There's too many travelers coming through our airport. So there's a real concern that this is really going to be focused on Muslims who have been so much the target of this administration's proposals. So what are the constitutional implications of these efforts? Can you walk us through the law on this and how it would apply if the Trump administration ends up targeting Muslims in the way it's proposed? Yeah, so it actually depends a lot on, on which one of these proposals we're talking about. I think if you're talking about a registry of actual American Muslims, that is almost certainly 
unconstitutional. Uh, you know, that would violate the First Amendment of the Constitution, which forbids the government from preferring one religion over another, mm-hmm. and also under the Equal Protection Clause, which guarantees that we're all treated equally and not discriminated against. So certainly that would, I think, very easily be kicked out as unconstitutional. When you come to a proposal like NSEERS, uh, one has to remember that NSEERS has previously been held constitutional by federal courts, uh, but I do think that the situation is different now. Mm-hmm. And there's two reasons for that. One is, at the time that NSEERS was held unconstitutional, there was no evidence that the Bush administration had any kind of overt bias against Muslims. In contrast, with this administration, we have many, many statements on the record uh, suggesting that they what they want to do is to put Muslims under pressure in one way or the other. The second thing is that the rationale for NSEERS was basically that the United States didn't have a good enough system for tracking people coming into the country and going out of the country. Those systems have been revamped substantially since 9-11, and DHS's own justification for taking down this program was that it didn't need it anymore. So I think it's going to be very hard for the government to argue that the reboot of NCRs is both not targeted in Muslims or that it's required uh, because of operational concerns. In terms of the third thing we're talking about, which is sort of, you know, this kind of questioning at the border and asking for social media passwords, I think the the answer there is, is less clear. I think it's a really bad policy decision, but it has to be recognized that there are certain uh, latitudes granted to government agents at the border. Um, so even though this uh, kind of questioning and this kind of social media monitoring uh, activities would be unconstitutional if carried out inside the United States, it's going to be a lot harder to prove them unconstitutional at the border. That being said, you know, we know for a very long time that, you know, there have been allegations that customs agents have uh, been racially profiling people uh, or ideologically profiling people, and that turns out to be a very important political and policy issue going forward. Mm-hmm. So what about local policing? You and your colleague at the Brennan Center, Michael Price, wrote recently about how the NYPD has been building its surveillance capacity in general. What are some concerns about how the NYPD's surveillance tactics will unfairly target Muslims, and, and what's being done about it? So in early March, Uh, two members of the New York City Council introduced a bill uh, which would require the NYPD to basically publicly announce the surveillance technologies that it was acquiring uh, in the broadest terms, not in operational terms, not in details about where it was going to deploy them, but generally, you know, we are using stingrays or we are using x-ray vans which can see through through walls. Um, those, that kind of information should be provided to the city council um, and that the NYPD must also have in place policies for when it's going to use these technologies and what it's going to do with the information that it gets. So this is a very, very important step uh, because as of right now, the police department can acquire these technologies basically outside the ambit of democratic oversight. Uh, and the reason the bill is so important is that it will allow both the city council but also the public to understand precisely what kind of information the NYPD is collecting and what it's doing with that information and when it's going to be sharing it with the federal government. You know, a lot of these um, agencies work together. The NYPD is part of a joint terrorism task force, which includes the FBI and includes uh, immigration agents, and it also has many other cooperative ventures with federal agencies. So what we want to be sure of is that we know when the NYPD is going to share New Yorkers' personal information with the federal government, and that would be relevant both for purposes of something like a Muslim registry kind of scenario, but also for some of the immigration enforcement issues that we've seen uh, coming up in the first few months of this administration. Well, Fize, it's been a privilege having you on the show, so thanks once again for joining me. I just want to ask you a few more questions, and then we'll close. The focus of this podcast is tech policy, but it also focuses on helping tech policy and other professionals be more productive and find more meaning and purpose in their work. Tell us, Fiza, what are your secrets? How do you stay focused and productive? 
Yeah, you know, I think my my basic tendency is to recognize that some days are just not going to be as productive as others, um, and to be able to kind of get over that hump and come in the next day and be really productive. So not to get down uh, when you feel like things aren't going your way, but to really take it as being part of the course of, of a professional life. And tell us the name of a book that you're recommending these days and why. So right now I'm reading this Japanese detective novel. It's called Six Four. Um, and I tend to read a lot of fiction uh, because I find that that's a really good way to clear my head. And I like to read fiction that really kind of takes me away from the kind of work I do and the political environment that we live in. So I try and go for exotic fiction, if you will. And, and it really you know, captures my attention and takes my mind off work for a few hours. Well, thanks again, Faiza, for joining me. Do you have any final ideas you'd like to leave with the audience before we close? And where can folks find you online? I guess the only idea I have is that, you know, we live in very, very interesting times these days. Uh, and I encourage folks to stay involved, stay engaged, and keep up with what's going on around us, even when it seems to be really overwhelming. And if you're looking for me online, I'm on Twitter at Faiza Patel BCJ, and you can find me there. You've been listening to Faiza Patel, co-director of the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law. Faiza, thanks for joining me. Thank you. And that concludes episode 83 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. If you like what we do here, we'd love to hear from you. Please take a moment and head over to iTunes and give it a review. It helps others know what they can expect from the show and helps us out tremendously. Thanks again to all of you for listening, and I'll see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 